Hello, everyone, and thank you for being with us today. My name is Brandi Pretlow, and I'm the Vice President of Programs and Services at the Steve Fund. Welcome to our community conversation, Interventions for Building Inclusive College Campuses to Promote Mental Health and Emotional Well-Being. The second in a series of webinars over the next few months focused on the Supreme Court's affirmative action ruling and what it means for the mental health, emotional well-being, and belonging of students of color in campus communities. To view our first session in the series, you can use the link in the chat. We would like to thank the American Council on Education for partnering with us on this community conversation. We also appreciate the generous support of Morgan Stanley for its support of this program. Before we get started with the incredible conversation we have planned for you, I'd like to share a bit more about the Steve Fund. The Steve Fund's mission is to promote the mental health and emotional well being of young people of color as they transition from adolescence into higher education throughout their higher education experience and as they transition into the workforce so they can attain personal, academic, and career success and achieve their full potential. As we are engaging in the conversation, please feel free to enter your questions or comments into the chat. And with that, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's conversation, Dr. Carlota Ocampo, the Provost and Vice President of Academic Affairs and Associate Professor of Psychology at Trinity Washington University and a Steve Fund board member. Thank you, Dr. Ocampo. Thank you so much. It's so great to be here to continue our conversation about how we can build inclusive campuses that promote the mental health and well being of students of color, particularly in the age of um, affirmative action rollback. So I'll just, I'll put it like that. Um, I, I do want to say that I know that everyone else has a beautiful background and I don't, my green screen is not working. So welcome to my parlor, everyone. You just get to see the inside of my office um, and we'll go on ahead. So we're gonna be talking about how higher education institutions can build structures and implement policies and practices that promote the mental health of students, along with faculty and staff, particularly those from communities of color in light of the changing policy paradigms and the campus changes they may spur. And you know, it's important for us to talk about students and faculty and staff because individual mental health is one thing, but community mental health encompasses all the community and it's really, um, it's a network of mental health that we have to foster. So some of the things we're gonna be covering very shortly include how inclusion and belonging are important to the mental health of the college community and how to center them in campus and classroom environments. We'll also provide some examples of proven and effective programming and services that support colleges and universities in creating campuses that enhance belongingness and sustain mental health. And finally, we'll talk about some ways to ensure support for the mental health and well-being of students of color and all students while remaining aligned with federal, state, and local mandates regarding DEIA initiatives. So um, joining me today, I'm delighted to have two wonderful colleagues, um, Dr. David Rivera, and Dr. Batsi Bunzo-Wabaya, who are also gonna introduce themselves and uh, tell us a little bit about why they're dedicated to this work. And let's start with Dr. Bunzo-Wabaya. Uh, thank you, Dr. Acampo. Um, So hello again, um, I go by Batsi, so that's also totally fine and I use she, her pronouns. And um, I come to this work in a lot of different uh, perspectives. So first, I am actually originally from Zimbabwe and I uh, moved to the U.S. to attend um, college. I went to an HBCU, Alabama a and uh, in Huntsville, Alabama. And it was uh, a wonderful experience and I think a great orientation to really thinking about what higher education uh, can actually look like for a lot of different students. Um, I then went to a PWI, Auburn University in Alabama for my graduate work and um, I'm a counseling psychologist, um, proud counseling psychologist. And um, I think, again, all of those experiences have really um, helped me to understand a little bit of what it's like as I work with students um, in my current role. So I'm currently at the University of Pennsylvania's Counseling Center. Um, it's called Student Health and Counseling. 
And uh, a lot of the work that I do there is um, individual uh, therapy as well as group therapy. But it's also really talking to what you were mentioning, Dr. Ocampo, about uh, community interventions. So part of my role is really thinking about how to talk about mental health to students outside of our offices and making sure that they not only understand the resources that are available to them, but also making sure that they use those resources, um, especially for our minoritized students who may have various hesitancies as to why they may seek some of those services. Um, so that's a big part of why that work is important. Um, it's important in a lot of different ways in terms of suicide prevention, stigma reduction, and just promoting help-seeking behavior um, on campus. So um, I will pause there, um, but hopefully some of the other parts of my role will become clear as we're talking. So glad that you're here with us. Dr. Rivera. Thank you, Dr. Ocampo, and hello, Dr. Bunza Obaya. Uh, apologize if I slipped to calling you by your first name since I know both of you very well. <laughs> um, just wanted to state that. So David Rivera, <clears throat> I go, can go by my first name as well, he, him, pronouns. Um, similar to Dr. Bunzo Abaya, my, my reasons for being here are both personal and professional. I'm a first generation going college student, come from a very low income background, a rural background with a lack of access to a lot of the resources that I now take as, uh, as very convenient living in Brooklyn, New York right now. Um, but my experiences as a first gen low income student in all levels of my education from undergraduate, which was at a a four-year land-grant rural institution in Wyoming to my master's, which was at Johns Hopkins, so a very different type of environment, to then my PhD at Teachers College, Columbia University, which was dramatically different from either one of the first two. So I, I take those experiences along with my professional experiences, which started as a student working in the Multicultural Resource Center at the University of Wyoming, and then transitioned into working into various other um, roles in student affairs, primarily initially that focused on inclusion and um, uh, belonging efforts, uh, primarily for um, students that identified as Black, Indigenous, uh, Latino, um, Asian American, um, or um, multiracial, or people from low-income backgrounds. Um, so really being entrenched in this world as a person of color who's been marginalized in various ways, but also professionally, where I've been able to work uh, within institutions and programs that um, were focused specifically on addressing inclusion and belonging for marginalized students to kind of bring me to where I am. And thankfully, I also come from disciplines like Dr. Bunzo Abaya. I'm a counseling psychologist, very extremely proud of that identity because uh, counseling and counseling psychology are really well known for their strengths-based approach for a very community um, uh, collective effort and also um, social justice and inclusion. Um, so I bring a lot of that with me and I'm thankful that I had that disciplinary kind of um, focus um, um, to my work and just um, a lot of other experiences that I'm sure are gonna come out as we have this conversation together. Fantastic, thank you. Well, I can think of no better way than to, to spend an afternoon than with the two of you. And um, so I'll, I'll also say I'm, as you know, Carlota or Carlota. And, you know, we had, when we were preparing this talk, we had quite a conversation about what it means to use doctor, last name versus first name for people of color. And, you know, how um, there's a whole web of complexity around formality or informality and the ways that names can be used and the importance of naming. But with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna suggest that we go ahead and shift to first names if that's okay with everyone, with the understanding that we know each other so well that we're used to using the names. But of course, you know, we do want to emphasize that it's very important, particularly for people of color, to often use Dr. So-and-so, because sometimes not using that can actually signal a kind of a power play. And that's one of the little tiny kind of microaggressions that I think we have to be aware of when we're in professional environments. Um, but with that, you know, I'm sure we're going to slip up. So just call me Carlota. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm pretty informal myself. Um, a little about my background, I'm actually a neuropsychologist, so I'm a little different. I'm not a counseling psychologist, but I did train at Howard University. And the, the training that I got had a little bit of a um, different focus, I think, from what many neuropsychologists might get. And specifically, I became very interested in the psychophysiology of living in a racist, incident-based society. Um, and how that impacts health and how it can impact community health. Um, so I bring that background to my work. And also as the provost here, 
I'm very proud to spearhead many of our DEIA and I will say anti-racist activities that we do on campus um, to support our student body, which is a predominantly, we're a predominantly black and Hispanic serving institution, one of few in the US that serves both populations. So um, thank you again. Um, again, it's great to be here. And I'm gonna start with a question, I think um, Batsi, Dr. Bunzawabaya Batsi, since we're, um, since you introduced first, um, I'll start with you and then maybe David, Dr. Rivera. Campus culture, it's a term that we use all the time, campus culture this, campus culture that. But in your you know, experience, what does campus culture actually mean? Is there one campus culture? And how do we nurture campus cultures that create inclusion and belongingness? So let's start there. Yeah, uh, that's a good question and a big question. And yes, Mati is totally fine. Um, so I appreciate you uh, asking and bringing that up. Um, I think when I think about my specific role, um, working sort of on the staff end um, of higher education, I think one of the things that's important for us is how do we make sure that students can even understand like the culture that they're looking for? So in some of the sessions that we're uh, having, whether it's individual therapy or even just group conversations, it's, you know, what is the culture that resonates with you? Like, how do you feel like you're either represented here or the content that's being shared or the conversations that are being had or the information that you're receiving feels like it's reflective or resonating with who you are as an individual, right? And understanding that it's not that all parts of the culture will feel like they resonate, but at least hoping that they're, they're pockets, that they feel uh, welcome, that they feel affirmed in, in every sense of that word, right? Because we know that for many of our students, when they choose um, their universities, they're making those decisions based on a lot of information. Sometimes it's funding for some students, for other students, maybe family live in that area. There are all of these reasons. But when they actually get to campus, they they now start to see whether the things they thought they were going to get are actually the things that they are getting, right? And I think sometimes for our students, that can feel really difficult because things are matching up in terms of culture the way they hoped. And then for others, it's it's a little bit different. So I think a part of it is just really understanding and helping to talk to the students to understand what does that look like for them? And then, of course, how do we meet some of those expectations in the best way that we can? I'd also say when I think about it as um, a psychologist and really thinking about making sure we're reaching students, it's a lot of it for us is like leaving our offices, right? Um, because we know that for many of our students, uh, coming into a building for mental health concerns is just not something they feel comfortable with. It's not an option for them for, for a lot of reasons. So making sure that we're really thoughtful of where are we going to make sure that our students are not only understanding our services, but they're actually seeing us. Um, because again, for many students to see a psychologist of color, it's going to be really meaningful to them to feel comfortable to even have the conversation with you. So a lot of it is going to informal events. Um, it's also offering our services um, to make sure that students are can be in different environments and still access us, whether that's telehealth or in person. So even having a counselor in different locations on campus, just to make sure that they they have access in that way. Because I think all of those things, if we think creatively about the services and the work that we're doing with our students, I think all of those things can signal a culture of inclusion because we're not just thinking about one student. So when we have meetings um, here with my colleagues, we often sort of ask this question of like, what student do we have in mind, right? So even when we say, oh, we can do this or we can't do that, or we can offer that resource, it's like, which student are we thinking about? So for example, when we have conversations around um, maybe calling a student's parents, right? Um, and expecting them to come to campus. It's like, what student do we have in mind that maybe that's a resource that is accessible versus a student where maybe that's not an option because their parents are working or maybe their parents aren't actually involved in their education um, in the same way, just because they don't really know how to navigate a higher education system in the ways that we might assume um, you know, parents or guardians or other people may know. So it's really sort of taking a step back and sort of critiquing even some of the assumptions we make so that our culture is as open and is as inclusive as possible mm -hmm. so that we're not um, sort of pigeonholing students in terms of the, the concerns they have, but also the culture that we think they should fit into. So I will pause there and um, yeah, turn it over. Uh -huh. 
That's great. I do have a couple of comments that I want to make, but let's hear from David. If you want to make them, feel, feel free. Well, okay, so we'll just right quick. I, I like your point that students of color are not a monolith and that we have to consider all the students individually while we also consider what impacts our institutional culture is going to have on them and their belongingness. So I think that's a really key point. And another point, I love what you said about getting out of your office. You know, I, um, I'm the provost and I think part of the, part of what happens, what has traditionally happened in higher ed is that we have a very hierarchical system and students aren't expected to sort of go up the chain and students who go up the chain by the time they're at my level, it's a problem. I really don't like that approach. I, I have an open door and I go, the students come in that door and they, they unpack their woolly bags of, you know, and they start unpacking all their things. And, you know, I, I take them and I look at them and I comment on them. Also, I go out of my office. And for a while, when I first became provost, people were calling me the people's provost, which I kind of love because I just go around and, you know, stop in and wave at students in their classes or interact with faculty. It's something that people don't expect. And I know that for any provosts or higher ed administrators on the call, I know that our time is very, very precious, but I would argue that this is time well spent because if you wanna create an environment where students feel like they can come to you or to those in charge to make sure that their concerns are going to be heard, you have to make sure that the students see you over and over and over and over again and experience you as an accessible entity for those students, you know, and I mean, the number of students who have said, Dr. Ocampo, you know, you really showed me that a person of color could A, B, C, D, part of just being out there in the community and setting that tone. So over to you, David. Love everything that's being stated already and shared on such brilliant um, insights from the both of you. Um, just to, to add a little bit to this idea of campus culture or cultures, rather, um, I do think that it, the campus is a conglomerate of many cultures that are interacting um, in various ways and in different ways at any given time, at any given moment, um, in various contexts. Um, I think that when a campus talks about um, having a specific culture, I like to step back and think about what does that campus represent? And if they're aligning towards a specific culture, it often is aligning with whoever is the most dominant um, population on campus, right? And it often is excluding the cultural experiences of those that have been historically and contemporarily marginalized. So if we're on a predominantly white institution, um, it's more than likely if there's a dominant culture that's being touted, it's gonna be probably one that reflects the white students and faculty and staff that attend and that work there and that care for that institution and not BIPOC um, folks uh, in particular. Um, I think that uh, when I think about a campus community where um, the campus culture is not only inducing inclusion, but encouraging belonging, I think about a, an environment where members, all members, students, faculty and staff, and I'll address that issue in a minute, um, all see themselves reflected uh, within the institution. As they walk around, they see reflections of themselves and not only literally people that look like me, sound like me and talk like me, but people that might have a similar worldview that can transcend the boundaries of race, ability, social class, et cetera. Um, but it needs to be reflected within the entire institution and across students, faculty, staff and leadership. It also needs to be reflected in things like the curriculum and not just in those disciplines where you typically would find inclusion and social justice like ethnic studies, women and gender studies, queer studies, et cetera, but in the chemistry department and in the biology department and in the accounting department, et cetera. Um, and I think we're gonna talk a bit about faculty inclusion later on, um, but it's really important that students, faculty and staff are seeing themselves reflected across the entirety of the institution. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about the focus on campus culture often looks at the experience of students and what they're experiencing often doesn't include the experiences of staff and faculty, which is a big mistake when anybody is doing campus uh, climate surveys that they don't include the entirety of the community, you're only getting a small sliver of what the experience is actually like. And so it's really important that we're also addressing how faculty and staff are experiencing the institution. I don't know about others, but at my institution of Queens College and within the City University of New York, 
we are seeing turnover like no other. And I believe this is happening across the higher ed landscape. And I think a lot of that is to do with how staff and faculty have been blatantly ignored, uh, especially those from marginalized backgrounds from the institution. I'm gonna start getting on a soapbox because I'm feeling some of that myself <laughs> in a variety of spaces. But I think it's really important that we think about the entirety of the community when we, when we assess campus culture. No, I was saying preach, preach. I, I think that this is, you know, kind of what I was getting at before that, that the culture is, I mean, culture is what the, the students bring their culture to the campus, but the campus becomes a culture and we have to consciously construct that culture. And we have to constantly con con consciously construct it in a way that makes sure that everyone feels a sense of belonging. And this is, this is a particular challenge, I think, in the age of, you know, this, our post affirmative action, I'm not gonna call it post affirmative action, but you know, at least in admissions um, and, and certainly some questioning about DEIA and the value of DEIA. And certainly we have the, um, you know, the uproar over, you know, teaching quote CRT. I, I don't mean to say it like that. Well, I do, because to me, whenever I hear that, I'm like, you mean teaching history? Um, I saw a meme recently that um, said, if your history is the required history in the curriculum and everyone else's is an elective, that's the definition of privilege. You know, part of making students feel like they belong is making sure that they, you said, are reflected not only in the what we would call the community, but in the curriculum as well. And that really involves a big rethinking about what the curriculum can look like and what, what are we really trying to teach here? I mean, are we trying to teach everybody to have certain names and facts and dates in their head? Or are we trying to teach students how to critically think for themselves, particularly in an age where, about, where we're, we are about to move into generative AI and they can learn about the Battle of Hastings by just saying, write an answer about the Battle of Hastings. I mean, I just picked that out of the ether, but you know, so we really have to start thinking about how to use our, critical thinking skills to create curricula that students can also step into and feel themselves in. So with, with that in mind, it's a new semester. We've just come out of, you know, COVID. I mean, the public health emergency ended uh, back, I'm using a lot of air quotes, I'm sorry, so-called ended. I mean, we know COVID is still around, but it ended back in uh, May, I think, or March or May officially. And now we're kind of all coming back somewhat face-to-face -face and having these expectations. What are you seeing in terms of mental health um, in your campuses? It, are students, do you think that they're still impacted by the COVID emergency and or, and or are there other issues that are very prevalent for them? Um, Dr. Botsy, what are you thinking? About? Yeah, so I'll start off first. I, I don't feel like I've heard too much yet just because we just started as in yesterday. <laughs> so I will say a little bit of, um, what I'm sort of wondering about or what's on my mind in terms of the concerns students may bring. Um, I do think there is still a genuine concern about um, issues regarding physical health. I think in a lot of different ways, um, whether it's for themselves or families, I think, or their families or loved ones, I think that we're hearing a little bit of that. I also think that one of the things we've been paying attention to is just the Surgeon General report around, um, you know, students feeling lonely and isolated. I think that's something we want to try to think about how to keep an eye on. Um, and I think it is very much connected to this idea of inclusion and belonging, because a student to some degree can feel a sense of belonging and can feel included in certain spaces, but that doesn't mean that they're not lonely, right? That doesn't mean that they're not still struggling a little bit with just uh, feeling connected, not just to the people around them, but even to themselves as well. So I think those are the things that, um, you know, we still kind of want to keep an eye on in terms of just thinking about our students. Um, you know, again, thinking about just general mental health concerns, um, you know, are students feeling um, safe in their environment? Are they feeling affirmed in their environments, right? Um, but also just some of the things that we're continuing to learn about the impact of depression, anxiety, um, mm -hmm. and just the impact that has on their ability to learn or their ability to connect with other people. Um, and even just um, their ability to, you know, a lot of our students are, are figuring out different aspects of who they are. And I think uh, for our minoritized students, it's also thinking a little bit about the things that they're being told um, in terms of just who they are and, you know, their worthiness, their intelligence, their um, ability to contribute to environments, which obviously the affirmative action, um, you know, ruling 
impacts a lot of those things. So I think there's a lot of things that are we're, we're keeping an eye on and just trying to think sort of proactively, how do we make sure that um, these are issues that, again, we're, we're just um, trying to respond to as much as we can so that for many of our students, um, they're getting the support they need as early as possible, as opposed to, again, us waiting for them to come to us. How do we make sure that we're going to them and, and just being proactive and, and understanding their mental health concerns? Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And Dr. Rivera, David, what about on your campus? What are you seeing or what do you think you might see as the year rolls out? Well, I need to stay, I work at Queens College and anybody who knows Queens College knows that we're located in the most multiculturally, socioculturally diverse borough, probably city in the world. And that's really reflected on our campus. And so we do not really have a lot of the issues in terms of building inclusion and belonging because we have a critical mass of people, which I'll talk about uh, later. Uh, but I do work with people from across other institutions. And even within our system, what I'm finding is that it's not just the latest uh, attack on race-based um, inclusion efforts, which is like how I like to refer to them. It's also taken in concert with what are being experienced as attacks on other uh, aspects of our sociocultural identities and experiences, um, such as the um, access to reproductive health care and the access to gender affirming health care, right, for large numbers of people. Uh, when I start experiencing or hearing that health care is now being regulated and um, highly, that is a basic human need. When our basic human needs are cut off, in terms of access that we need to institutions and services that just promote our optimal well-being, that is critical. And so I think that what's happening and what I'm experiencing is that students even here in New York, which is, you know, one of the havens, if you want to know, of, of liberalism, which is protecting many of us in terms of the laws that are impacting us here, we're still experiencing, though, the, the general stress coming from the federal level. And I think that's what a, a lot of students may be contending with in some ways. Um, even if they're not aware of it, I still think is probably having an impact. Um, and so I, I think about the um, kind of overall picture and landscape of what's going on uh, with the threats to inclusion and belonging that are coming from a variety of, of areas and how that's infiltrating the worldview experience of people, even if they happen to be placed in a geographic area where there are um, legitimate protections, so socially speaking, we're still, we're still um, exposed to the rhetoric, to the discussions, and to the potential fallouts that may be experienced down the line that we still don't know what's going to come about. And so there are geographic differences, um, there are institutional differences. I do know that more than likely those institutions that have already taken up the mantle of, of including um, diversity, equity, belonging, and inclusion issues throughout their system and their um, in an institutionalized way, they're probably going to fare off a bit better than those that um, weren't doing that initially, because now they're they're left in a place where they may be even more um, threatened from, um, may experience more threats in terms of trying to incorporate DEIB initiatives in the institution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for those comments. And, um, you know, I'll reflect that. Um, and I think, Dr. Rivera, David, you were, you were part of the task force. Um, so the Steve Fund did convene a COVID crisis response task force um, with a number of points um, uh, on how to respond um, to student mental health crises. Because I think one of the things that we saw during COVID itself was, you know, of course, there was the, the health emergency, which was traumatic for everybody. And, and probably a lot of people are still experiencing some post-traumatic stress from that, faculty and staff included. Um, and then there was also the economic downturn, you know, that, that many of our, you know, students of color's families themselves and their families suffered from the most. A lot of frontline workers too in our populations um, and, and, you know, just people who were um, disparately impacted by the COVID phenomenon. And then on top of that, there was the George Floyd murder followed by, I mean, not that, and that was sort of on a continuum, but it sort of raised, you know, public collective awareness to an even greater level about the need for interventions, particularly around anti-Black racism. And so students began to see a lot of, um, you know, diverse kinds of social media consumption around that issue, much of it supportive, but some of it, you know, the, the counterforce, the counterforce. And, and, you know, 
um, I know that in this particular webinar, we're going to focus on solutions. So, you know, I just want to say that 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 kind of social disruption is then followed a little bit by this, you know, again, political nadir with respect to rollback and affirmative action and other things. So there's kind of a, a, a it's, it's sort of a miasma in the atmosphere, you know, that, that everyone's feeling like, what's up with civil rights? Um, that I think is impacting our students, even if they're not vocalizing it. So I urge everyone to check out the Steve Fund Crisis, uh, uh, COVID Crisis Task Force report, which is great. Maybe we can put a link in the chat um, if, if a moderator has that link handy, um, even for people to access. But let's move on to talk about some, what are some interventions that you've put on place? We've sort of talked a little bit about here's the problem, here's campus culture, here's how students are presenting. What are some interventions that you have been doing or may or new interventions that you may be doing to impact campus culture, belongingness, and individual mental health for our, our unique students. And again, we'll start with Batsy. <laughs> I'm just sort of going on a round robin here around my screen. Yeah, no, I actually wanna start where you um, uh, just ended your comments, which is just listing all of the different components of what many of our students have um, experienced over the last few years. Um, and I think it's uh, one of the recommendations from the task force that you mentioned from the STEE Fund, where they talk about this idea of building trust through trauma-informed leadership. And yeah. I think that yeah. has to almost be the starting point because we understand fully the impact that trauma has on a student's ability, not just to you know, learn and socialize, but to even tolerate being in certain environments, right? Like a student needs to be able to regulate their emotions um, to actually be able to take in information or to feel like they can fully show up in any environment, right? So it feels like we have to start there and just um, at times even just making an assumption that some of our students have experienced significant traumas, like just starting there and then really thinking about how does that inform the way that we then interact with them? Um, how do we make sure that we are um, listening for the ways that they may feel unsafe and I don't just mean in a physical or in an emotional sense, but in a physical sense as well, right? Um, where if they're feeling threatened, it's hard for us to expect that they're going to thrive. It's hard for us to expect that they're going to achieve a lot of the things that we hope they do when they're uh, on our campuses. So I think, uh, Carlota, when you were saying that, I feel like that's the place to start. It's just really thinking about uh, trauma-informed leadership and just really um, understanding what those needs might be uh, for many of our students. But I'd also say some of the um, other things that are helpful in sort of thinking about wellness on an individual level, as well as just the community at large, is uh, one of the things we've been really trying to, to work through is thinking about wellness uh, based on the various domains, right? So thinking about physical, emotional, social, intellectual, financial, right? All of the different components so that we're seeing our students in a more holistic way. I think it's, it's one thing for us to think about their uh, specific emotional needs or social needs. But we can't do that if we're not thinking about who they are as spiritual beings or uh, their career aspirations or finances, right? Um, mm -hmm. All of those things impact their ability to be well and to, again, engage in their academics in the ways that we expect. So that also has to be uh, prioritized as like really thinking about our students fully um, so that we're understanding who they are, but also the things that they need from us. Um, I would also say, I think, uh, which is another recommendation from the CEEP, I'm trying not to just like quote everything from there, but it's really a great oh, resource. So good to talk about it, yeah. Um, but I think working collaboratively, I think um, it's hard to do successful work um, in any environment, but especially in higher education, if you're just trying to work in a silo, regardless of what your role is on campus, when you're thinking about supporting mm -hmm. the needs of our students. Um, and then for some, for faculty and staff, depending on what your role is, um, it really is about working collaboratively. We have to talk and making sure that we're not just um, sort of mimicking some of the same things we hear from our students, that the way they feel isolated, the fact that they don't feel connected, right? If we're not connected with each other and sort of understanding how we each work to support our students, then of course they may also feel um, that they're trying to navigate a system or a space that feels disjointed, that feels disconnected. Um, so we need to talk in order to make sure that, again, we're building a culture or various cultures uh, where we're really, really making sure that we're communicating effectively. Um, and again, of course, dedicating resources to make sure that that um, dedication to mental health resources or needs for our students um, 
are understood. And I understand that for some higher education institutions, resources can be limited. And obviously that's something that we want to be thoughtful of is just how do we use the resources that we do have and making sure that for the things that we can really dedicate the resources to mental health, that we're doing that and we're being clear about um, the importance of mental health um, on these campuses in our communication. And of course, again, in our culture and how we, we navigate things. Um, but I'm sure David has even more of a thoughtful response in sort of thinking a little bit about that question, Carlota. Uh, just to add on to your brilliance already, I'm really I'm not happy, but it's important that we bring up trauma-informed issues, that we talk about that T word a lot. That is what our students, that's what our staff, that's what I'm experiencing as a faculty, are these traumatic responses to issues that not only are coming from within the institution, but that are coming from society overall. So um, I've been talking and training a lot about trauma-informed leadership principles and frameworks, and I'm finding that to the groups that I've been training, and it's across the board, that is one of the areas that people are gravitating towards in, ter in terms of wanting to have that kind of knowledge and experience. So if there's something that folks leave this with, it's go and bone up on your knowledge of trauma-informed leadership and frameworks and start to incorporate that. For example, I was doing a training with, um, um, I do a lot of support of people that are working in um, uh, college and access and success programs. So the TRIO programs and some Garrett programs. And I was just doing a training with some of these professionals a, a few weeks ago, and we were talking about applying the trauma-informed um, uh, framework to their to their work. And we were talking about what are the, there, there are so many policies and procedures across the university. If we just start there, those are written down often. Those that, those that are not written down, that's a whole nother mess of a story that needs to be addressed. But especially for those that are written down that we can identify, you can literally do a trauma-informed audit of those policies, thinking about how are these policies um, supporting maybe a deficits approach as opposed to a strengths-based approach? How are these policies reflecting the identities of those students that are seeking and being impacted by these policies? You just take financial aid, for example, right? So we can think about financial aid and how just the concept is experienced differently by every student, especially those that come from a first-generation low-income background. Mm -hmm. People from a low income background have a have a, a tricky relationship with finances often, especially young folks. I can attest to that from my experiences. And so often just interacting with financial aid can induce traumatic responses for students from low income backgrounds. And so how can that office do an audit of its policies and procedures to help ensure that it's not inducing uh, issues that are a threat to psychological safety, but actually promoting um, issues related there. You can even think of, you know, I got my my start, my first job was as an academic advisor to undeclared students and students that were on academic probation. Just think about academic probation. We're using a carceral term, probation, in the institution of education, which has a long history of doing that. Um, but that's very problematic. Students often just respond to that. And if you're a black or brown student that has been highly criminalized, often from birth, that's going to have a, an even larger impact in terms of what it might trigger in terms of your experience there. Am I attending a, a, a jail college now? Right. And so just thinking about the language that we use and thinking about applying these trauma informed perspectives can be very helpful. I also think about the idea of representation and how um, oftentimes I, I've experienced at the number of institutions I've worked at, and I work at the gamut of them, that oftentimes just including um, a few students that might represent a marginalized background is enough. And it's not. We need a critical mass of people that represent everyone on campus. And Thankfully, at Queens College, I experienced that. There's not a moment, hardly, that I walk across campus or interact with my students or my colleagues in my specific department where I'm not experiencing reflections of myself and my worldview. But when that's missing, um, the institution then needs to think about how can they maybe create a microclimate or a climate for students where they're going to then see reflections of themselves. A great example, and you can just Google it, is the Community Scholars Program at Georgetown University. And I had the distinct privilege of um, coordinating that program for four years. And it's been around for 50 years, so it has a long um, history. But this program was specifically designed to create a microclimate that would induce belonging for students that are coming from racially marginalized and socioeconomically marginalized backgrounds. And it has a lot of success. The graduation rate is on par with the graduation rate at Georgetown. Um, but the, the community, it's called Community Scholars, and so it takes a community effort, right? A community emphasis. And I find that students that were not a part of the program 
when they would find out about it, would often get upset that they weren't included because of just how strong of a reputation that program had for providing that community um, at the onset of the college experience and supporting it um, for throughout their uh, four or maybe even more years while attending the institution. So the institution needs to think about what's going on, how is representation actually being addressed, and are we doing it in a, in a critical way where we're, we're now hopefully um, going to end up with a critical mass of diverse sociocultural identities on campus where folks can then see themselves reflected across the board. Wow, oh my goodness. I, well, I'm about to go on the warpath with this term probation now. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Um, you know, fortunately I'm in a position where I can bring this up and, and really am in a position of impact. And, you know, hopefully many, you know, folks who get into positions of impact will think this is what trauma-informed leadership looks like, right? Is thinking about things like that and saying, hey, let's change that. I can, to now I, I to I'm, I'm, I'm having an epiphany as we speak about, gosh, maybe that's why it's so hard to get students to respond to our academic support you know, advisors, because they're, they don't want to be on probation. Makes, that makes amazing sense. But anyway, um, I love everything that you all said. And, and, you know, I think that trauma-informed leadership is key. Um, where it may not be attainable, I think everything is attainable. But where, where we may have to get there with baby steps, I think that, that it, persons in individual departments can set themselves on, you know, the trauma training pathway. And, you know, I was speaking before about students coming in and unpacking their little rolly bags. And, you know, they start with, you know, here's my homework and here's my, you know, Metro card and here's my lunch bucket and what's in it. And then they start unpacking the deeper things, you know, and a lot of times it is me understanding how, what, what, how do I now refer this student based on what she has told me about the traumas that she's experiencing, the unaddressed traumas that are impacting her ability to be successful in college. Um, and so I, I, so I love that. And what I want to say about that is it, is it is extremely important to have a lot of communication and education to the entire community, including faculty and staff, about what the, um, what the referral channels are and where students are going to get the help that they need for the different things that they present with. Um, and the, the other thing about collaboration now Again, I'm speaking to those who hold the keys to the money bags. Um, when at, DEIA cannot be one office or one person, we can't say we hired a chief diversity officer, we're good now. I mean, that's a great first start, but the, the, the DEIA mindset has to permeate across all units, including units that might not look so diverse. Why? Because it's extremely important for every citizen of this United Nation to be educated around issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion, whether or not they see themselves in a bucket that would be impacted by that. I mean, part of the reason why we're in the pickle we're in now is because people don't see themselves in that bucket and don't understand perhaps that we are all intimately connected in one network of a society that what impacts one person is gonna impact the other person whether they see themselves in that group or not. And that, that means psychologically, it means health-wise, it means economically. I mean, we're Amer you know, we're in this society together and it's only gonna work if we're all, you know, working together. So uh, get off my little soapbox there. But um, let's talk for a minute in a, the couple of minutes that we have left, we had talked for a minute about how can faculty get on this train? You know, what can faculty do to really support and help students? Um, so let's talk for a minute about um, faculty and inclusive excellence in the classroom. Round robin. So I'll be brief because I think uh, David should probably say more about this since I'm not a faculty member. But I will say one of the things we, we often hear from faculty but also see um, demonstrating the research is, uh, Carlota, when you talked about this idea of students are bringing their experiences, right? They're sharing all of these things that are happening. I think that's um, occurring in so many different spaces with our students, including in the classroom. And some of what we hear from faculty is, I hear it, I see it, I don't know what to do with it. So one, I would rather it not come up at all. Or two, if it comes up, I just don't know what to do with it. And I really care and I want to be helpful, but I just don't even know what to say or do. Um, and partly because uh, faculty may feel like they don't have the skills to, 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 to sort of respond to what's happening in the moment. Um, 
but they also, um, I think at times are also overwhelmed by it and they don't know how to integrate the information that they're hearing into still evaluating the students. So sometimes I'll, I'll hear from uh, faculty that like, I'm scared to tell them they didn't really do a good job, you know, on the task that we gave them, whether it's an exam or homework assignment, because I don't want to upset them, right? So, but then if you think about it, especially for our minoritized students, then they're losing out on really helpful and valuable feedback, right? So yes. it's it, we need these skills to make sure that um, faculty feel empowered, feel comfortable, not necessarily to step into the role of a therapist or a counselor, but just that they know how to respond and to what you were saying can connect them to appropriate resources, but that they're also not shying away or shutting down students who may also um, just need a level of compassion. Um, so again, I'm not saying they need an intervention, they don't need you know need therapy. I'm saying just compassion in that moment and empathy. Um, and then that can actually drive what happens next. Um, but again, I'm not a faculty member, so I just wanna make sure that I'm leaving enough space for David to talk more specifically about some of those things, but um, giving the tools and the skills uh, to our faculty so that they know at least what to do with what they're hearing because um, it's no longer an option to to just not engage when it comes to uh, student mental health needs or trauma or any of the things that we were talking about today. And, and we need to hear that message that you just gave us from people like you that are in the throes of the mental health wellness uh, paradigm on campus and what that's like. We need that communicated to us. Um, I will say that if faculty do not take an active role in fostering DEIB in their classroom environments, that these efforts are going to have severe limitations overall. Oftentimes, faculty are the only people that a student will consistently come into contact with in any given semester. And if that faculty person isn't then the conduit to connecting them to the appropriate services on campus, but also if they're not inducing, again, inducing means we got to do something active about it, right? You need to put it into action. If we're not inducing DEIB issues within our classrooms and attention to them, then we're going to, again, the, the, the professor is often the supposed leader of the, of the classroom. And if they're not doing it, students are not going to feel compelled to do it. And students are going to take that as a message that you don't care about me or about these issues, right? When people don't say or do something, they're often thought of as being complicit with whatever the harm that's being done um, is, uh, uh, whatever harm is happening, right? Um, and so, um, for example, um, I'm part of um, the CUNY, um, what is it? CUNY Innovative Teaching Academy, um, which is, you know, if you know, if anybody knows CUNY, we're a system of about 25, 26 colleges and, and institutions that make up our university system. So we, lots of colleges across the city um, that communicate, but often don't, but this program is centrally based. And what it did is bring um, a, a group of uh, people that are staff and faculty from across various disciplines to engage in some intense training. And I was one of the trainers on how to induce DEIB issues within the university experience, not only in the classroom, but beyond the classroom. And then these group of about 20 or so people um, were then charged with creating a workshop that they can then use on their campus and their department and their program. And again, they come from a variety of programs. Some are librarians, some are, are social sciences, some are physical sciences, some are coming from the world of business. Um, but we're training them how they can then have these conversations and talk about it in ways that make sense disciplinarily for them. And so they're, they've produced a whole wide array of workshops that focus on racial belonging, focus on neurodiversity, you know, focusing on English, English language learners, um, focusing on LGBTQ issues, so a whole host of issues. And so once these are created, we can now have a repository of a variety of trainings that are now really role modeling for people who might not be like me or you, Carlota, or Batsi, who are trained in these issues, who have this as part of what we do. But now we're now teaching others how to do that. And then we're teaching them how to do that for others. So it's kind of a train the trainer model that's been around for quite some time. But it's a way of really encouraging people to take a very critical um, intersectional and collaborative approach. We got to start doing that. That's a primary reason why I became a faculty. I was really big in the student affairs world in terms of my work and, and the, my trajectory. And then I decided as I was working a lot with academic affairs, I'm like, they have a lot of uh, decision making and financial power. That's disproportionate compared to the campus environment often. I'm not going to say that always happens, but that's often an issue. 
And so my my whole goal is to help to bridge that divide as much as possible. And so I still uh, do that with a lot of the work that I do, including this um, uh, CUNY Innovative Teaching Academy that I'm now um, um, a part of. That's, that's great. Thank you so much. So we've about reached um, the end of the time for our this part of the conversation, and we're going to move to questions. So I don't see any questions in the chat yet, so I want to make sure that the audience is aware that if you have questions, just um, pop them in the chat or the Q&A there, and we'll be happy to answer them. But I did want to sort of um, draw some thematic points out of some of your discussion and also kind of add on to what you were just saying about faculty. Um, I, I, agree, I, I believe, as you stated, that it, it's sort of unrealistic to expect faculty that, ca that to expect faculty to walk into a classroom and be sensitive around DEIA issues or, um, uh, you know, around uh, uh, campus climate issues without providing training. Okay, and this is this is super important. So I think I mentioned on the last um, webinar, but I will mention again. If anybody wants to look at a campus-wide um, program, um, Trinity has a campus-wide program called Driving Actions for Racial Equity, DARE, that you can look at on Trinity's website. And it has a series of action points under it around how we can drive actions for racial equity on our campus and in our community for our students and for the community as a whole. And point three is about inclusive excellence, which is about um, training faculty as well as revising the curriculum, something we were talking about earlier, making, making the curriculum inclusive and also training faculty, giving faculty the tools. Now, no one expects faculty to be psychologists, but what you said resonates with me so much. I mean, I remember when I was a student, you know, I knew nothing about what's going on here and I would just pop into a class and whoever was at the front of that class was to me, that was the institution. I never heard of a provost. I never heard, I mean, we didn't even have chief diversity out officers then, but I, you know, who are these people? So it's the person and that person could even be an adjunct. You know, I mean, if, if that's the person at the front of your classroom, that's the institution. To many students, that's the institution, particularly commuter students or students from first gen backgrounds or just backgrounds where they're not, you know, very familiar with the, the hidden curriculum. And so to get the information from that person, to, to equip that person with the ability to be sensitive to a student who to, to use trauma-informed approaches to understand when a student might be in distress, when a student, when there might be a difficult conversation that needs to be managed in a way that's going to be productive for everyone in the classroom. But these are these are trainings that we have to provide to our faculty as we expect them to be responsive and to partner with us. I mean, they're there, they're trying to teach their subject, whatever it is, you know, they're just in there trying to teach astrophysics, and all of a sudden there's a student with a trauma. Like, how do we support that faculty person to be able to say, okay, just like what I said before, this is my, this is my, this is my, um, this is my uh, 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 script, not to say that we shouldn't bring our humanity to the script, but here, here's some scripts I can choose from. And then this is the referral message. And, and it may even mean walking with a student to hand off that student personally. Sometimes it's not even, oh, fine, here's, here's the office number, go over there and talk to them. No, no, no. That student's going to get lost between here and the office. Sometimes it's walking with a student, you know. Well, gee, so tell me more about like what happened with your homework. And while we walk over here, and let me let me just introduce you to you know Dr. Bunza Wabaya here. She's gonna she's gonna pick up from here and figure out you know how we can help make sure that that doesn't happen again. Um, but you know, I think that overall, what I've heard in this conversation, and let's see. Oh, we have questions. Yay. Okay. Oh. Where do I get DEI material for students in health sciences in higher ed? So DEI material for health science students, that I, I'm assuming that could be um, doctors, nurses, um, students studying any kind of you know, health, science, uh, re health science research, biology, that kind of thing. Um, and then we have another question, how do you help Asian American students who felt relief after post-affirmative action? I had a student who shared that his local school had rules stating that only 25% of Asians are allowed to be admitted. I don't know how to process cases like this. Oh, wow, that's a good one. Um, well, it's we, we have 10 minutes to answer that student's questions. How do we help students who are happy about the affirmative action decision? Because we know that there's every, you know, every viewpoint in our society is, is a viewpoint and people are coming from different places. 
And also if anyone has like links or, or something like that where they can drop in DEI material for health sciences. Um, so those are our questions. Who wants to start and where do you want to start? I'll just share a, a little bit about, you know, the DEI materials. There's a lot out there. Um, there have, there's been a lot of even focus, micro focus on, <clears throat> on STEM and health professions. I would say probably every na na major national organization that supports professionals working in healthcare or STEM, well, healthcare particularly, you're going to find that they probably have recommendations for how to address DEIB issues within that uh, profession. For example, if you're a psychologist, the American Psychological Association has done a great job of, of kind of, of, of not only creating <clears throat> positions that work at the main office that are in charge of DEIB type issues, but really creating resources with the help of you know, expert psychologists and what have you that can then inform um, others on, on best practices. And I know that other um, national organizations that support various uh, professions within the allied healthcare um, industry are doing the same thing. And so I say, start there. And then again, thankfully Google's a fun, not a fun, it's a useful resource, um, but looking at other um, institutions that might've already started this. That's how I kind of do my research on best practices. I'm like, I'm gonna see what's out there. I'm gonna see what's been studied empirically. Um, I'm gonna see what the thought leaders are kind of promoting, especially within my specific discipline and then kind of take it from there. So while I'm not giving you a specific resources. There's a, a process for kind of investigating and finding out the specific resource that might make sense for your, um, your discipline. That's great. And I see that one of our Steve Fund um, um, colleagues is also typing an answer, so probably providing some resources. But um, Dr. Botsi, what do you think about this? Or the other question about how do we, oh, okay, that question may have been answered. Uh, but if you have anything to add, and then I think let's talk about how we help introduce the idea of the post-affirmative action decision as being um, uh, you know, a setback for those who feel like for them, it was a benefit. Yeah, um, I think this is a great question. Um, I'm taking the second question. And I think um, to what you were saying uh, earlier, Carlota, I think it's a good reminder that not all, all students will, will respond the same way, that they may uh, think about their situation and sort of think about the impact that it has on them specifically. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the things that I feel like would be important, um, obviously understanding where that student is coming from or students are coming from in terms of how they're feeling about it, but I'd also say, I think sometimes um, some of the things that I've read about the affirmative action decision, um, it can feel as though minoritized uh, groups are being pit against each other. Yes. Like if, if we're giving this group, you know, this thing, that means you're going to have less of it, right? So it sort of fosters this idea of this scarcity mindset that I think um, being able to sort of help, whether it's students or anyone else, sort of take a step back and just say, you know, what are some of the resources or what are some of the things that you want access to? And what we're trying to create is a world where everyone has access to those things, right? It's not about picking and choosing who gets a certain resource or who gets um, a higher education um, experience. It's how do we make sure everybody has access to all of those things? So it's good that you feel that you have access and how do you join us in sort of thinking about how everybody can have access? Because that's really what we're we're trying to get to, but not just access to um, any environment, but to as diverse and as affirming environment as possible. Um, that's really what we're hoping for because we know that that has benefits for everybody, right? It's not just um, you know wanting diversity for diversity's sake. We actually understand that it helps um, not just people's experiences in terms of mental health, but in terms of the educational experience and what they're able to learn because they're hearing from a lot of different people. They're seeing a lot of different things that again, in thinking about the world we're navigating now, as I mentioned earlier, I was an international student, right? So it wasn't just about understanding how um, folks here navigated the American um, environment. Um, I also had a lot of really great friends from all over the world. And I think that really did help me understand not just how to navigate certain social situations, but I think it helped me to really be a, a better psychologist in understanding how to talk to different people, how to work with them, um, but then also to, again, have empathy for people who have different experiences from my own, right? So there are all of these benefits, not just in a personal level, but the research proves that. So I think just being able to really talk to the student so that they sort of can feel what they feel and maybe feel happy for themselves, 
but encourage them to also think about what can this decision have an impact on when we think about other groups as well as, as your own, regardless of what identities they hold. Um, David, is there anything you want to add to that? Pretty much, we have a very similar outlook on this. I think the conversation piece is crucial. Every campus and every community is experiencing this in a different way. And one of my messages in the last webinar was we, people at your, at your institution, I'm talking to everyone watching this, you need to talk to your students, all the students, as many as you can, about how they're experiencing these issues, how they're experiencing the rollback of race-based inclusion policies and, and programs. How are they? How are they experiencing that? And I think this is where history and and having a historical lesson on the nature of higher education inclusion, right? There's a story there. There's a narrative there. There's a very rich narrative there that can help explain some of the dynamics that are going on right now. But this is where you know critical race theory, for example, can be very helpful in explaining the nature of oppression and how that will purposefully pit marginalized people against each other as a method of distraction and as a method of keeping people in a certain place and location that they might not want to be in, right? They might believe that they might want to, but they might have been led there in some way. But I think that having these discussions on the nature of oppression, how it operates specifically in higher education across the history of higher education and how some of these things might be replicating themselves, right? But how, again, this narrative of of especially Asian American um, students with the minority myth uh, that has been, the, the model minority myth rather that has been propagated immensely across higher education and across society and how those kinds of things again have been the product of oppression, right? And and that's what we 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 have to really resist being um, um, redirected towards kind of thinking that we are pitted against each other as marginalized folks and think about the, the nature of oppression overall and how the system of oppression works in concert to keep people down um, of marginalized identities together. Yeah, I love that. And I love what uh, Batsi said too about um, empathy development. Um, anyone who has you know encompassed a multicultural campus. So I mentioned that Trinity is both a predominantly black and a Hispanic serving institution. And then we also have Asian and white students, um, as well as you know, students who, who prefer to identify themselves in other ways, different ways. Um, and so um, as with many you know, multicultural campuses, there are times when groups will come into conflict. And that could be this, this could be, you know, you know, on the dorm or in, in a classroom, you know, where people will, you know, I'll just, you know, well, Latinos do X, you know, and, and then Latinos all, you know, stand up, no, we don't, or whatever, however that might unfold, right? And this is part of our training that we do with faculty actually is managing difficult conversations and how to enter. So there's a whole set of trainings on this. But also I think one of the things that we did here was we brought together students in conversations together around issues that everyone cared about. So for example, with our women of color, one of the issues that many of our women in col of color were concerned about were things about um, the way that they wear, the wear their hair in public. And this could be whether they're black, whether they're Latina. You know, another issue that came up was, um, so we did a whole series called Pelo Malo, where we showed some video about the whole idea of hair and brought people together and allowed people from different cultural groups to talk about what is the meaning of hair for a, a woman of color in our society. So we found that, I'm just giving an example. I'm not saying pick this example, pick an example that your campus is comfortable with, but find an example of an issue that people want to talk about that they don't have opportunities to talk about across, you know, cultural groups and bring them together to focus on that rather than, you know, rather than necessarily talk, come together and talk about, you know, let's have an encounter experience around this racial issue. Right, more focus on something that we can be in together and talk about together to develop an understanding with each other about how this particular issue might imp impact all of us. So for example, with the example of hair, it's an amazing, sadly, symbol of oppression and how you know oppressive forces have differentially impact different groups. And people walk out of that session with a sense of like, wow, I never thought about that. You know, so that's just an example, but I think that developing empathy in people to really understand how, okay, I might feel like a certain social decision helps me get my slice of the pie, but at the same time, 
is it really just like, are we going to sit here and worry about this one little slice of the pie? I mean, don't we have to worry about everybody being able to be a part of this? Because as you said, Bossy, these are not scarce resources. They're not. There's plenty of room for everybody in higher education. Let's get them there because we need everybody to be educated in order for our society to function properly. Um, okay, so I think we're one minute over time, but this has been great. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, David and Batsy. It's always so wonderful to spend time with you. And I loved hearing about campus culture. I loved hearing about your take on how students are presenting at campuses with their mental health issues. And I loved hearing about some of your solutions and particularly getting into those difficult conversations and really trauma-informed approaches. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to, um, oh, David, for your I'm pitch. A, yes. A pitch. And so I didn't talk about it purposely because this is a significant intervention that induces belonging on campus if it's kind of followed through. So we have at the Steve Fund, we've developed the Equity and Mental Health on Campus program, which is based and formed off of the Equity and Mental Health framework that we collaboratively developed empirically with the Jed Foundation and also the Crisis Task Force report that Carlota um, uh, referenced that um, has also some sets of recommendations and also implementation strategies. But the EMHC program, the Equity and Mental Health on Campus program, brings together um, institutions of a variety of, of types um, for an 18-month kind of cohort program where they go through a process of evaluating and assessing their campus cultures for issues of <clears throat> wellness and well-being specific to students of color. And then they look at how they might implement different strategies across the system, across the institution, with the goal of institutionalizing these issues so that they are perennial and everlasting, right? We don't institutionalize these programs with funding and with staffing and with environmental space, right? They're likely to disappear when the person that's in charge of it or that was was um was um holding it um takes it. Thank you for putting this up here. So this um if you go to our website um cfund.org, you'll be able to find more information about this. Um if you email emhc at cfund.org, you can be put into contact with um our amazing um staff who support this program. But I've been a coach of this program um for uh, a few cycles. And I can say that every institution that we've worked with has reported and are leaving a bit better in terms of addressing the mental health and wellness issues of their students of color, which have an overall effect on the entire campus. Mm -hmm. That's great. Okay, yeah, thank you so much. Yes, yeah, so, and you can see there that you can find uh, a lot more information about this program and um, you'll receive a lot more resources about how to um, implement many of the strategies that we've been talking about in this webinar. Um, so again, it's been wonderful. Let's do this again. Um, look forward to working with both of you again very soon. And I'm going to hand it over to Brandy Pretlow, our Director of Programs. Thank you, Carlota. And thank you, David and Bonsi, for such a full and wonderful conversation. Um, so on the screen here, we have our next upcoming community conversation on September 19th. Um, focus on supporting student belonging and mental health at a time of change. Feel free to use that QR code or the registration link. Um, also, just a reminder to fill out the webinar evaluation. We're always looking for feedback and ways to continue to engage with y'all. And with that, I hope you have an incredible evening, afternoon, morning, wherever you are. Um, for more information and questions about the Steve Fund, please visit our website, stevefund.org. Thank you and take care. Thank you.